good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of the NFL podcast. Hope you all guys are well at home. Hope you're all doing good. Hope you had a lovely weekend and hope you're having a good week so far. We've only got, how many, we released this on Thursday, so there is eight days until Christmas Day. So I hope all of you have got your shopping ready. I'm looking around on this screen to see if anyone here is. Are you all done? Oh, Dan is. Fred, you done? Rob's not. <laughs> I'm done. It's a good thing I have a missus because she does it for me. <laughs> That's crazy. I don't know what I've got. But we've got eight days Christmas. Uh, we uh, had an exciting weekend of NFL action that we're going to go through. Um, and we're going to go through that now. Um, don't forget, uh, down below in the description is a link to all of our social media pages. Please go and click on that and give us a follow. Uh, and top right, if you're not subscribed already, um, go and give us a little subscribe and click on the bell and you will get instant notification for when we go live with any of the videos. Um, enough of the jibber jabber. Let's get into it. Uh, Rob, I'm going to go to you first this week. Um, I'm going to shake things up. How did the Falcons get on an hour and how unhappy are you this week? Um, I'm sort of just accepting it now, I think. <laughs> um, it's just nothing new anymore. I think the thing about the NFL season is it's so short. And in the off-season, as soon as like the Super Bowl's done, it's like, I want football to come back. And you wait so long for it to come back. And then when your team performs so poorly, it's just horrible because it's just such a short season. And to watch your team basically play like idiots for you know the the vast majority of it you know it, it's it's horrible so like in some sense i was thinking earlier like oh, i can't wait for this season to be over but then you think no because then like next year what am i going to do for like six seven months <laughs> well, um, i've been a temper fan for the last 12 years mate <laughs> <laughs> literally <laughs> Fred's so, never known nothing but Super Bowl runs, you know. <laughs> this is awful, this is. <laughs> um, I think what made me mad about this weekend was the manner of the loss. I mean, we're playing the Chargers that have got a worse record than us and are basically the same sort of team as us that literally they find a way to lose. And I think if there was a way for both teams to lose on Sunday, then they were the two teams to find it. Other than maybe the Jets, I suppose. But in terms of like throwing games away. Um and yeah, it just it's just the manner of it really. Um I think you know, when you look at the teams that we have lost, the games that we have lost, I mean some some of them, yeah, we should have lost. Um and others you could sort of flip some of the season on its head. Um, you know, when we lost the Cowboys, whatever the, I forgot what it's called now, the analytical thing that gives the percentage chance to win, the Cowboys had a 1% chance to win that game. Um, when we lost the Bears, they had 3% chance. Um, we lost the Lions, they had 2% chance. We've lost twice to the Saints. I'm not as high on the Saints as, you know, some of the power rankings that you see out there. And I know people said on here that, you know, I think that they're the, best team in the NFC and obviously they are up there in the rankings but when we played them twice I wasn't that impressed with them and I thought both games were there for us to win and um, you know it's we just had a season full of mismanagement um, poor play calling poor decisions by the players as well um, on the field and it's just all culminated into into what's happened I mean, I talked about two teams trying to throw it away. I mean, in the last couple of minutes, we had the ball chance to go down and score to take the lead, and we threw an interception. The Chargers got the ball back, and what did they do? The first thing they did was throw an interception to us. <laughs> and then what do we do? We threw an interception to them. And it's literally like two teams that were just like, no, nah, you go and win. No, nah, you go and win. No, nah, you go and win. And then, you know, in the end, the Chargers have gone and won. So um, what was good... Russell Gage in the Wildcat, um, that throw to Ridley, that touchdown was probably, you know, one of the best plays I've seen the Falcons do this season. Um, we tried that a couple of weeks ago. I can't remember exactly which game it was, um, but Julio should have 
made the catch and uncharacteristically, uncharacteristically dropped it. Ridley's broken a thousand yard season. That's obviously not in the game, but um, that's good for us. AJ Terrell looks the real deal. I know a lot of Falcons fans, myself included, when we drafted him, we're a bit underwhelmed. I think it's because he literally got torched in uh, the national championships last season. But I think other than that game, he was you know, one of the best cornerbacks in college football. And this season, you know, he's, he's stepped up and he's playing well. And obviously, Koo um, is just, you know, I spoke about him last week. He's just, you know, been incredible for, for us as a kicker. Uh, what went bad? Um, I think our run defence has been okay this season. I think we're the, in the top 10 um, as a rush, run defence. But we literally struggled against Eckler. He just, you know, we just couldn't cope with him. But we did hold them to just 20 points. I think when you hold a team to 20 points, you've always got a chance to win. I mean, it's not like you're conceding 40 points, you're conceding 20. And um, so, you know, I'm not going to, it's not an insurmountable lead. So I'm not going to throw too much blame at our defense. I've seen a lot of people blaming Matt Ryan. He did have a bad game. But I think, you know, the way that he's played for us over the last 13 years and, you know, you can't, he, he has had a bad game, but we didn't lose that game by three points just because of Matt Ryan. There was other factors um, that came into it. Um, the Chargers, similar to us, seem to have a playbook written on a fag packet. Um, I think you know, 80% plus of their players were screen passes. And, you know, the way that we just continue to let them um, play screens and just, you know, it was like it surprises every time. And it's like literally every time they got the ball, like you just knew that that was likely to be, um, likely to be one of their plays that, that they made. Play calling again for us being an issue. Um, I've said it, you know, multiple times before. Um, I can, I think we were third and eight. Um, and our routes were about six or seven yards, and then we stopped. I mean, you know, stopping short of the sticks on third down, especially when you're running, you know, you're running such a short route, and you know, you're not going to get any separation or anything. And you know, they just didn't work out for us. The play action, um, play as well. Um, everyone just seemed to trip over each other and fall over. So Matt Ryan just had to. You know, he intentionally grounded it and that was another penalty which sort of killed that drive. So, yeah, it's just another bad week, really, and I'm not really looking forward to uh, <laughs> next week and then having to sit here and talk to Dan. So, um, I might so be watching that, that next, uh, <laughs> next Wednesday. That was going to be my next question for you, is how are you feeling going into um, the big game, which is on our predictions as well, um, this week? Um going into this Sunday, how are you feeling? Are you confident that you can get something out of this? Or are you doing what Tom Brady loves to do over the internet when he gets the W is to go onto the Falcons and try and beat them? Um, fuck's sake. Uh, so, well, how are you feeling about this weekend? Shit. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh... If you want, I'll, when we get to the predictions, I'll uh, elaborate a little All more. right, no worries. Uh, uh, for let's, now, let's, I'll just leave it. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> let's carry on with that theme we've coming up this uh, this Sunday then. Dan, I'm going to go over to you. How did you yep. How did you feel that the Bucks played over the weekend? And how, how much are you looking forward to? Or how much of a challenge do you think the Falcons will be this weekend? Um, so looking back, first of all, um, 26 win, 26 14 win over the Vikings. It's a really great game. There was mm, pretty standard, pretty routine. 200 yards, two touchdowns. The only thing to come out of it was Dan Bailey has lost the ability to kick a ball. Uh, three missed field goals, one missed extra point. You could blame that for, for, for the Vikings being losing. Um, I know the Vikings fans on the internet have had a lot to say about some questionable calls shall we say um, Kirk got hit in the face by a forearm smash to be fair to him um, which wasn't called and it probably should have been 
Uh, we had a DPI on a Hail Mary at halftime to Gronk called. I think it was the first one since 2009 that Hail Mary's drew a DPI. Um, so they're up in arms about that. But if you watch it, it is a foul. There is defensive pass interference. He's got two guys, one holding him down from the back, one in the face of him, doesn't turn around, doesn't play the ball, arms up. Yes, that happens on every how Mary and it isn't given, but that doesn't mean it's any less of a foul. Is that the Brady effect in Tampa? I don't care. It was a foul. We'll take it. Thank you very much. <laughs> so next week, Falcons. Um, I'm looking forward to it in the sense that <laughs> We can tie up. I can just up. see Rob just shaking his head. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, mate. <laughs> what we need to do, though, is an over-under on sacks on Matt Ryan because your O-line is horrendous. Our defence can blitz. I mean, we sacked Kirk six times this weekend. You're giving up eights in games. It could be a over-under 15 game, right? So... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, the first few games, I thought our O-line did a really good job and I was pretty excited, you know, yeah. about them. They would seem to be doing a lot better job of protecting Ryan. And then, you know, it's just sort of, you know, falling apart for us, really. And we have got some some injuries across across there now, which is, you know, not helping us either. So, and like I said, when we played the Saints, Ryan got sacked eight times and we just literally could not cope with the blitz. So, yeah. Which is um, what we're yeah. renowned for right now, yeah? So Matt Ryan could spend uh, a lot of his time sat on his ass, really. <laughs> so we had Vikings that I think it was a first and 10 from the 11, so an effective first and goal by all accounts. And it turned into a sack, a penalty, a sack, fumble, which they recovered, and it ended up being a 44-yard field goal attempt, which was ultimately missed from the 11. Um, so, yeah, I am positive on next week to a point that I've been a Tampa fan long enough to know that we could still screw this up yet. We went nine and three. I think it was 2016. Lost the last four games and missed the playoffs. So until we're there, we're not there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we shall see. We shall see. Right, let's move on. Uh, Before we get on to Fred, um, and talk about the abysmal Cam Newton display. Um, I'm going to talk about a god of quarterbacks that's going to happen. It's Tua, um, the god of all gods, the future. He's going to be. I'm going to paint him on a ceiling, Tua's face, just because he deserves to be looked at. Um, that's how good this man is. But let's talk about. I'm going to quickly talk about. When I say quickly, I've got quite a lot I want to talk about. Um, the Miami wise uh, going into the game. I put on a very brave face. I was shitting myself going into this. Um, The only thing that I was confident about was our defence. That was it. Um, And the only way that I thought we would be able to have a chance of getting into it was if we did what Tua was good at and do a no huddle. But then at the same time, I didn't want to do a no huddle because then that would mean Mahomes would get in more often and we didn't want him in. So we, it was a bit of they, what they tried to do in the first half was they did well keeping it 7-0, um, got an interception. Uh, during the whole game, a uh, whole of this season so far, um, Patrick Mahomes has thrown two interceptions the whole season until he stepped foot into Miami. Um, and he threw three interceptions in the whole ga- in, in the game, which to me shows that, one, our defence is very, very good. It also tells me that whatever Mahomes does, he's still going to be throwing it and he's still excellent and no matter what he does. And that was my worry. Um, I want to say as well, the defence sacking Mahomes for 30 yards, um, which was, I think I celebrated more with that than I did when we actually scored a touchdown, to be honest. Uh, it was it was just great to see. And we'll talk about Tua as well. I just want to talk about him just because I'm praising him. And for me, he had... An excellent game. Uh, he threw 28 out of his 48 throws. He got 316 yards, the most he has thrown throughout his career in the NFL so far. He got two touchdowns and the one interception, which if you look back at the interception, um, for me, wasn't his fault. Um, and also, at the same time, the person that was meant to catch it should have caught that. It was quite an easy catch to get, but he didn't put it off. But 
he, we all see that Tua is now human. He's not godly like we everyone thinks he is. Well, I do. Um, the one thing that worries me the most um, is the running game. Um, and we all know Dan loves a running game um, in the NFL. And if you compare our running game to uh, Kansas City's, um, was the, the the person that did the most running for us was Washington. He had 13 carries for just 35 yards um, during the game. And then if you carry, and then if you look at uh, Kansas City, the one important run that they had was for 32 yards, and they got a touchdown out of it. Um, and that was the only the worry we have. And if you look at the receivers as well, um, De- uh, DeAndre Washington got he got one rushing touchdown, which was I think was really close in. Um, we got another guy that got four carries for 19 yards, um, and then we got the receivers that got seven seven receives for 82 yards, um, five receives for 60 yards. And Mike, um, I can't ever say his name. Is it Greshki? Kasiki. That's thank you. Uh, Kasiki, who for me, if it wasn't for him in that game, we would have lost by a mile. Um, he was absolutely superb. Five five receiving, 65 yards, two touchdowns. But then if you look at their tight end, um, Travis Kelsey, he had eight receptions for 136 yards um, and one touchdown. Um, that's Kelsey's fifth game of the season with at least seven receptions, 100 rushing yards and one touchdown. The most games in a single season by a tight end since 1950. There you go. ESPN facts for you. Not that you <laughs> needed to know that. Um, it's the most turnovers that they've had, um, which we forced four turnovers. Um, and the Chiefs have done the most punts where they did five um, but the only thing that I'm worried about now going into the game against New England was we all know that Belichick's record against a rookie quarterback. He has a magic spell against rookie quarterbacks. Um, and our, if we've got the amount of injuries that we've got at the moment, we're starting to play the second team um, going into it. And I think if we had the complete first team going in against Kansas City, I really do think we would have won that. Um, but we lost. And I think there's a lot more positives that you can take from that game um, than there were negatives. And that's my belief. Going into the Patriots game, I think we're going to win. Um, I think we need two more wins. We've got the hardest running um, out of all of them um, going into it. We've got the Pats, then we've got uh, Raiders, and then we've got the Bills um, coming up for the next three, I think the next three. Um, so we've got the toughest running. I think if we can get two wins out of that, um, I think the two wins, if we do get them, will be the Pats, and I do think it will be the Raiders um, just by their performance that they did on the weekend, um, I didn't really see anything good coming from them, um, in my opinion. So I think if we're going to win, it has to start this weekend. So, yeah. Right, Fred, let's talk about your display of only getting three points. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been a really good week in LA, 48-24 aggregate. So I think we've taken that before the week. In reality, we were awful on, on Thursday. Um 24-3, it goes back to the same thing I've said pretty much most weeks. It's a well-coached, bad side, but the problem is we do lack ability. I think we're better defensively than offensively. I don't, don't doubt that. Um, but we do this thing, we've done it a few times, and highlight it, I might have highlighted it before, where we go to sleep really early on and then sort of tighten up from there. We did it against the Cardinals, we're 10 nothing down, did it against the Texans, did it against the Bills, did it again against the Rams. I don't know why it is, because we then, you know, if you're then going to get beaten 40-50 something, then you sort of think, well, we've just been awful. But they, they do tend to play a lot better after the first quarter defensively. But we allow fast and hard yardage against us and almost invite sides into the red zone early doors. And it's really frustrating, because it, it does happen time and time again. Um the problem is, as soon as we're 10 nothing down, we don't have the offence to dig ourselves out of it most of the time as well. I think you can argue with the Rams. The Rams are a better side. There's no, <laughs> no doubt about it. So you're in that situation where if you're 10 nothing down against them as a Patriots side, in the situation we're in, we're not going to win that game. Pat start, uh, Rams started very well, ran the ball really well with Cam Akers, 171-yard game from 29 attempts to him. He won an FC Offensive Player of the Week. He was just excellent. 
Uh, as a side note, he's actually the sixth different Rams player to win that in 2020 as well, which gives you a bit of a bit of an eye um, into sort of how they're getting on. Um, Jared Goff comes in for a hard time at times. I think the media, I think he did just about enough um, because obviously Cam Akers has been so good and allowing him to run the ball so well. That it's sort of, yeah. It's a the run game. <laughs> <laughs> Makes your quarterback look good. Look at that. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So as long as Aces is there, Goff's going to look wonderful. Um, um, I think this Rams side probably have a really good chance to win the NFC West by week. Then they've got the Jets, which is pretty much a, a freebie in it, really. And they've got to go to Seattle and beat beat Seattle, which we've got a good chance of doing. I know we're talking about Seattle later, so I won't go into that too much. Offensively, I don't know where to start. So there's a point in quarter two. Uh, where they ran it 12 times in 13 plays. You get inside that red zone. They ran it four times and got stopped. Now, if you're a Rams defense against the Pats, which I think were eight yards out, you know they're just going to run it four times. That's all they've got. They haven't got any any throwing, uh, any passing, really. Um, and they got stopped, you know, and got stopped all four times and, and lose the turnover the ball. Um, you've got Harris being handed off the ball, Sonny Michelle being handed off the ball, and Cam running the ball. As long as you get those three covered, you Perhaps the stuff really. Uh, it's got to the point though, that said, where it's really difficult to bemoan it because that's all they have got, you know. Um, it's not as if we've got this great passing game and, um, you know, we're not using it. You know, Cam was nine from 16, I think 119 yards through an INT. Um, there's a point, it just sums up how limited the offense is, really. I think in court three, this is the worst one for me. I, I just thought, what are we doing? I think it's about a third and eight. Cam got good protection, stood still, he had time. Then the whole thing was like a freeze frame. Cam had stood there with the ball in hand, no one near him. The receivers had stopped. They, they were just stood still, fully covered. Cam doesn't know what to do. Receivers aren't moving for him. They've got to where they want to be. And Cam throws the ball away in the end. And you just sort of stood there thinking, this is just, I don't know where, what I'm hoping for here. And I don't know, it's sort of just a slowly dying, really, this offence. And it sort of seems to be getting worse and worse every week. Um, charges aside, but it was a big special teams defensive performance, really, more than anything. Um, you can point to a few good games for Harris, who carries the ball well. He's done OK. You can count on one hand, though, the games Myers and Bird have played well in as receivers. Where the Pats do well and win games is defensively. I think we all know that. I think you can outthink a side defensively and prep well, even if you have a limited talent, which they do. I don't think you can outcoach a team offensively if you've got limited talent and you can't throw with an OK run game, a particular of a good defence like the Rams. I think everyone knows how the Pats are going to try and play. Good times, good teams will shut the Pats out pretty much on that. For what it's worth, I don't think the Pats will start Stidham either. Um, mathematically, whilst the, you can still make the playoffs, I know the playoffs are pretty much a done thing, but as far as the Pats are concerned, but I, I don't think they'll start him. I think you might as well give him a go. Has he proven himself when he's come on? Not really. He hasn't done horrifically either, but he's had a bit more game time over the last few weeks. I don't see what you've got to lose, though. I, Cam's position is becoming more and more untenable by the week. I think you might as well give Stidham a go, see what he's got. Got a couple of weeks here. Um, luckily, this week, we've got a team, a nothing team we're playing against, a team who you don't expect to win against, even if I start the quarterback. So, really, we're looking forward to week 15, I guess, with what I'm saying there. But, um, but yeah, it's just frustrating. <laughs> it is so frustrating. In a weird way, I'm enjoying the season, though. Well, at least you're enjoying it. Uh, that's <laughs> that's the best thing out of it. How do you feel, again, with your cha your chances this this Sunday, um, going into it, do you think there is well, there is always a chance everyone can beat yeah. anyone um, in the NFL? But do you really see your your offense actually trying to beat the Miami, the great Miami defense? <laughs> not that I'm being biased or anything. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Miami are a side that have improved pretty much every week. It started quite poorly. I mean, mm. Too, but they've got better and better defensively got better and better um, which is the main concern because I think like I said we're, we're better defensively than we are offensively so against a good defence I don't know the only thing we've got in our favour as you mentioned is Belichick's record against the rookie quarterback yeah. um, and that, that's about it but um, obviously in the predictions I will have to go for the patch just out of some blind loyalty but yeah it's going to be a tough tough week Talking of uh, quarterbacks that struggled, um, Carson Wentz. Um, we're going to talk about the Eagles um, now. Going to move on to them. Um, Jalen Hurts. Um, he come in and beat the Saints. Um, 
with a fantastic display. Um, he threw for 167 yards. He got one touchdown. Um, let's compare that to the stats of Wentz in the game before. Um, he threw for 79 yards. Um, and he got sacked four times and Hertz didn't get sacked once. Do the, I've seen a lot of different people saying that Hertz is not the future of the Eagles, but they look like they found more confidence in Hertz <laughs> than they did Wentz. That's why the overall performance of the Eagles was so much better. Um, Dan, I'm going to go to you. Do you agree with that statement? What do you think turned for the Eagles um, this week compared to what they've been doing? I think Hertz gave them a different option. Hertz looked very Kyler Murray-esque in the way that he went about what he'd done. He has got feet and the guy can move, right? Um, which gives you a dual threat to it. Is he the greatest passer? No, he's not. But he's a quarterback that rushed for 106 yards on a Saints defense that isn't a bad defense at all. It is up there. Um, does that buy the space to, to make an error with the throat? Probably does. The Eagles, I think, use Miles Sanders more. There's been a lot of complaints about him being underused in, in recent weeks. And here we go. Use your running back. Make it work. Makes your quarterback look better. They weren't using Miles Sanders. They weren't running the ball. Carson Wentz is benched to go hand in hand. Miles Sanders was used. He had 115 yards and two touchdowns. That draws the linebackers up into the gap. That means you've got more man-on-man -man coverage, which means your receiver's going to make more space. It buys you your quarterback another foot on the throw. The gap, the window he's got to find is a little bit bigger every time because of it. Um, and if your quarterback can scramble and pick up 100 yards a game as well, then, yeah, that's a huge weapon to have in your arsenal. He took a lot of hits different to Kyler Murray. I think Kyler Murray's baseball background means he gets down very well and is very aware of what's around him. Um, he will often step out two, three yards before a hit just to avoid the contact. He knows he's got to look after himself. Hertz, for me, was playing with, well, a job on the line, I guess. That was his chance. So he put his body on the line and you can't fault a man for doing that. Can he do that long term in this league? No. As a quarterback, you can't. It won't work. He will get hurt. Uh, he's not the biggest guy, I don't think, build-wise. But, yeah, he looked good, mate. He, he gave them a different option to what they had. Um, I don't know. I think they need to just play it through and see what they get, what it comes to. They've got Wentz stuck on the... Yeah, for now, I'd roll with a dice on Hertz and just see whether that was a, a one hit, a surprise, no tape on him, no video on him from the Saints. Whether over the next three weeks, other teams start to scout, pick up that video and, and adjust mm -hmm. it accordingly. So, Rob, I'm going to go to you on this one. Um, people saying he is not the future, even though I think they drafted him quite high um, in the draft as well. Do you see him as the future? Do you think that they need to go out and get someone? What is the future for Carson Wentz? Where do they go with him now? Um, <clears throat> well, I'm glad you asked that question because that's sort of like what I've written here is sort of taking a bit of a different spin on it. And yeah, they drafted him in the second round. Um, and to be Perfect. honest, the, <laughs> <laughs> the big loser in this at the moment for me is the Eagles as an organisation. And... Mm. The reason for that is is that they handed Carson Wentz a four-year extension worth $128 million, which doesn't start until next season. Now, next season, Wentz is due to pick up $35 million. If they cut him, the dead cap space that they'd have to carry is $59 million. So what does that tell you? They've got no choice but to keep hold of Wentz next season. And, you know, the dead cap the year after, it does, it swings the other way, but they're still going to have to carry a lot of dead cap space. So for me, like I said, the Eagles are the big losers in this as a team because they've handed Wentz someone that they're obviously massively high on or were a four-year contract extension starting from next season on huge money. He's not performed. They've now put in a quarterback which they drafted in the second round and things have improved. I mean, 
like Dan says, you can't fault him for going out and getting a win, whatever means necessary, really, against a Saints defence. Um, but if they're playing for the rest of the season now, and then they come back next season and decide, you know, he's the man and Wentz is going to sit on the bench, you're going to have someone sat on the bench earning $35 million, which is 17% of the total salary going to their entire team sat on the bench doing nothing. That's when next season the Eagles are projected at this moment in time to be $66 million over the cap. So they're going to have to be massively creative and you don't want somebody taking up 17% of your cap space sat on the bench not playing. So where are they, you know, I just, I, if it carries on playing out like this, then I think they're going to be, the, the, the organisation for the next couple of years is going to be the big losers in it. And they've got two options in that. They either restructure the contract and give them a huge signing bonus and reduce the guarantee. Why he would do that makes no sense to him whatsoever. Um, the only other time it happened was Brock Osweiler when he went from the Texans to the Broncos. He was huge dead cap space. The Texans traded him to the Broncos for, they gave him Osweiler, a second round pick and a sixth round pick and got nothing in return but him off the wage bill. He was costing them 16 million. So compare that to Wentz. You're going to have to pay someone to take him off the books. And that's well, what yeah. But I don't... looking for a QB and we've got a lot of cap space. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you could do, it a, a you could do it a fix to help out as well, right? So... <laughs> yeah. But I think, I think that's the point is that who out there, even with the cap space after this season, is going to say, yeah, we'll take a punt on Wentz. And no, I don't think anybody is. No. Um, so I think they're stuck with him. And then if you're stuck with him, do you want that much of your cap space taken up by someone who's sat on your bench? It's not the sole reason to play somebody to say you're not performing, you're not good enough anymore, but we're going to play you because you're earning $35 million this season. That's not the right reason to play him. But that's what I mean by this is that mm -hmm. the losers are the Eagles as an organisation. So, Fred, I'm going to go to you. Mm -hmm. uh, quick and easy answer I'm going to ask you. As I think we've covered it all. Mm -hmm. um, do, how will... Do you think Carson Wentz will start next season for the Eagles is the one part of the question. And secondly, if you were the Eagles, how would you get rid of him if, if he wasn't your starter? <laughs> um, good question. Right. Firstly, um, I don't know. I think realistically, if Hurts continues to play how he did uh, and does well for the rest of the season, then you're in a very difficult position with regards to Wentz, as for all the reasons highlighted there. But if, if Hertz wins a couple more games, um, you know, it's still not impossible they could win this division as well. Um, you know, then <laughs> I don't know how you manage that situation. Um, second part of the question, how do they get rid of him? Well, they're going to have to be really creative, aren't they? They're going to have to give up all sorts of, you know, possibly trade draft picks, um, as Dan highlighted already. It's a hell of a lot of money, isn't it? On <laughs> and a wage bill that is already oversubscribed for next year. So, yeah, you're gonna have to just beg, steal, and borrow on that one, really. But it's a little loss. I think Hertz, if he continues to do well this year, I don't see how they can really go back to the wins apart from the financial argument. Uh, but that's not really an argument that's particularly valid if you want to win games of football and he's playing rubbish, really. Um, so I think he does start next year. Purely on the basis, they'll need him to have four or five good games so that they can shop him. If they bench him, his trade value is nothing. If they start him, they've got. To, if it goes wrong, they've got time to switch back to Hurts and recover the season. But if he gets four blinding games under his belt and they start well, he has trade value. They can probably catch him in then. Just quickly, I think he Jalen, starts on Jalen Hurts. Just um, another part of it. He was only the second rookie quarterback to rush for over 100 yards on a starting debut, and um, the other one in uh, Lamar Jackson, who's doing all right so that's yeah really good uh really good positive stat to have on next to your name really so let's go on from one quarterback struggling to another one um the texans and mr jackson uh struggling oh, they got absolutely destroyed against uh 
it's Chicago. Um, who they, I've got it right in front of me. Why am I looking around at who they played when I literally have it right anyway, uh, right in front of me? Um, during the game, he got sacked eight times um, for a loss of 64 yards. Um, they sacked the Chicago quarterback three times for a loss of 26. Um, this is this is the stat that blew my mind. Um, on the fourth downs, Houston were one for three. Chicago never had a fourth down. Well, you wouldn't. You punt. Well, yeah. Well, no, yeah. All right. Well, you you well, would if you punt or not punt. They says it says zero for zero on ESPN. So I'm going with them. <laughs> um, they pass. Uh, Houston passed for 155 yards. Um, Chicago passed for 241 yards. Uh, they uh, Houston rushed for 108 yards. Chicago rushed for 169 yards. The stat that I found, I found quite fascinating, but you lot probably wouldn't, was um, Houston were on the ball for 30 minutes and 25 seconds, um, and Chicago were on the ball for 29 minutes and 35 seconds. So basically a minute less, and Houston and Chicago still destroyed them. What has happened to Houston? Um, Rob, I'm going to go to you. Um uh, yeah, top wide receiver and the top cornerback were doing drugs, and <laughs> <laughs> they've gone. So, <laughs> um, yeah, Will Fuller this season. I mean, they got rid of Hopkins um, last season, and Will Fuller has improved very well, and now everybody knows why. Um, <laughs> so, you know if you're going to lose two of your top players it's going to impact upon you and when that you know their performance is enhanced because they're doing peds then you know it's sort of a double whammy I think the Texans now are in a huge mess because they have traded and traded and traded to try and win a Super Bowl like this year and it's not worked out for them they've been creative you know they've they've got rid of um, Hopkins they've traded away a handful of players they've traded away draft picks for nine players in return which they felt these nine players will elevate us to been Super Bowl contenders and they haven't. You know, they've got some they've got some good players out of these trades. But now you look at the situation that they're in and the struggle that they've got. And they've not got a first round pick this year because Miami have got it. And they've not got a second round pick this year because Miami have got it. So they don't pick until the third round. And I think it's one of those things where if they'd have gone on and won the Super Bowl based on trading away their future in terms of draft picks, then everyone had said, you know, they're geniuses. But it's backfired on them. They've had a terrible season. And now they've no draft, they've no draft pick in the first two rounds to try and... And they're going to be good draft picks as well. And the, you know, the situation that they're in, they're looking at, what, are they like seventh at the moment? So Miami... Who wins that trade? Miami. You look at what Miami did last season in the off-season and where they are now. And then they're going to have the first-round pick this season, but they're also going to have the Texans' first-round pick in the top 10. And then they're also going to have the Texans' second-round pick. So Miami have won that trade, hands down. And that's going to give Miami a chance to like accelerate you know, their growth into the future. So they've gambled on building a Super Bowl-caliber team and lost and it's cost the general manager his job and they're in trouble now Dan do you see Deshaun Watson do you see him uh, this season so far he's thrown for 3,761 yards um, it's the first time I think this season that he has been sapped eight times in a game um, to my to what I've found um, do you see any do you think that where do you see him going? Do you think he's he's going to have to stay there and sort it out? Do you think he's going to demand to maybe go somewhere else if the things don't pick up? Because he's a very talented quarterback, let's be honest. Um, he's a very talented quarterback, but what is the future for him? He's a top five quarterback in the league for me. 
Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, I see Deshaun Watson almost being like what's happened with Matt Stafford at the Lions, that he has the potential to be great and the organisation let him down. Um, Deshaun Watson, what does he do? He's in the contract, he's staying for now. If they trade him, they've got nothing. Like, he's all they have got right now. He's the face. He's the only thing that they've got that may help them attract some free agents and things like that in the summer because, as you just said, trading's out the window. Uh, uh, Picking, sorry, is out the window. So they need someone to come in and and be the face that generate interest in people coming to them. I think he seems like a person who's got a lot of pride and respect as well. So I think he'd like to see the job through. Whoever comes in as head coach is obviously going to be a big part of that. Um, One of the rumours I've heard is they may look at his old college coach stepping up because that would obviously keep him there or at least keep him interested in staying there uh, and help scheme for him because they were successful together. Um, Yeah, they need to go out and get some free agents this year. There are a lot of running backs that are in contract years, so potentially there's a lot of bell cow running backs about. Um, there's other people, wide receivers. So, for instance, Chris Godwin's in a contract year. There are face of franchise players that are going to be available. They don't have the picks to gather anyone, but the free agency, if they're not picked up by their current companies, they're going to have to go that route if they've got the cap space to do it. And I don't know where they stand on that, to be honest with you, without looking into it. So, so talking yeah, of the wide, rec- the wide receivers yeah. part, is the, the gentleman you just said, Chris Godwin, and Juju Smith, uh, the, the guy from the Steelers contract, runs out at the end of the season. Apparently, according to some reports, uh, they are in good talks with, uh, or the agent is in good talks with Miami um, to be going there next year, which is something that we fucking need um going forward but talking Fred I'm going to go to you Mm -hmm. um Jackson's contract I've got it in front of me here um he signed a 156 million pound million dollar contract over four years he's got a signing bonus of 27 million his average salary is 39 million he's his total guarantees are 110 million um, and guaranteed at the signing was um, 20, uh, $73 million um, on that. Do you feel like the Houstons over the next few years will be able to produce a team to keep him happy or not? Well, they, they sort of have to, really. Um, I know yeah, they have to, but do you see them doing it? Well, as Rob said, they've traded away to the first round pick to Miami already. Um, second round pick as well, sorry, did you say? Yeah, um, they're in a situation where obviously they lost two very good offensive players to drugs. There we go. Um, the, the, I think the issue with Texans, in all honesty, they're, they're exactly where they deserve to be. They're a four and nine team. Um, they've they ran the Colts close in a one score game, but they've been thumped a couple of times. Beat the Lions, beat the Pats. Can they produce a team to keep um, to keep Watson happy? Well, yeah, over the next at some point over the next two or three years, yes. But I mean, next year is probably going to be another year that is very similar to this one, really. Um, so yes, it's not a quick fix, is it? Talking of not a quick fix, that's a nice segment into the Jets. Um, talk about Seattle Seahawks, and thanks, Fred, for that. That was quite a nice transition. Quite nice, thank you. Um, let's talk about Seattle Seahawks. I want to get your both opinion on Seattle. All, well, all of you, opinion on Seattle. So here's some of the stats that they had, and we know it's the Jets, um, and they got absolutely friggin' annihilated. Um, so Russell Wilson threw um, 21 out of 27 for 206 yards, four touchdowns, one interception. Um, they ca- they rushed uh, 30, uh, 36 times for 174 yards and one touchdown. I want you to put that comparison because I wanted to say that the Jets also rushed uh, for 23 times for 69 yards um, and no touchdowns. Uh, the Jets um, also receiving, they receive uh, 14 times for 132 yards um, and Seattle uh, received for 239 yards and four touchdowns. I know it's the Jets and I know that it's not a mass and it's Jets. It's Jets. Can, is there, Seattle are a very, uh, were a very good team. 
do you see them making any challenge at all this year going forward? Uh, Fred, I'll go to you first. Yeah, um, honestly, I, I think they're a better than average side, but I think you can get also get a fairly good gauge of where they're at as a side if you look at who they've lost to. So, lost to Bills, lost to Rams, lost to an improving Giants side. You've got a very good quarterback who's capable of, of big performances. Uh, <laughs> I think a big performance against the Jets, but a lot of people can have big performances against the Jets. So I think you almost have to disregard that. Um, but the only team they've actually beaten with a winning record is Miami. And that's when Miami were getting going as well. That Miami weren't very good at that point this season. Um, I think they'll finish 11 and 5. I think they'll make the playoffs. I don't think they'll go very deep, um, though, if I'm honest. So, Dan, I want to go to you. Russell Wilson, um, what would you make of him? Uh, he seems to be Seattle's number one and obviously should be. What do you make of Russell Wilson? Do you like Russell Wilson? Um, it's In a football sense, it's hard not to like a guy, right? He's mm-hmm. incredibly, incredibly talented. We sat through six, seven, eight weeks this year talking about how he had to be the MVP. Um, I think we even said on this show before, though, as, as Fred just alluded to, that the Seahawk defence is what lets them down. The offence will put up points. The defence will let them down. Every time they've played a decent playoff team, they've come unstuck because they will also put up points against them. Um, yeah, Russell Wilson is phenomenal talent. There's nothing else to be said about it, mate. He's exceptional. Uh, I'm going to go to you, Rob. I'm going to ask you this question. Do Seattle uh, rely too much on Russell Wilson and DK Metcalf too much? Well, I mean, you know, like Dan just said, Russell Wilson is incredible. And, you know, the point of having a franchise quarterback is that he can put the team on his shoulders when he needs to Mm -hmm. and carry them through. Similar to like what Mahomes did against Miami on Sunday. You know, it was looking tight. And second half Mahomes just said come on everybody jump on my back and I'm going to carry us forward and we're going to turn this around and Russell Wilson is another quarterback which you know you would bank upon to you know have that in him and he is a phenomenal talent and DK Metcalf is a phenomenal wide receiver so if you've got a phenomenal quarterback and a phenomenal wide receiver who can get open I don't see the problem in, you know, throwing to him at every opportunity that is free, really. Um, but yeah, the Seahawks, I you know, agree with what Fred and Dan have said. Um, you know, I think the Seahawks have beaten some really good teams like um, the Falcons this season. <laughs> um, but you know, when you look at who they who they have beaten, um, the Jets. The 49ers who are like savage with injuries, the Vikings sort of before they started to turn their season around a little bit, the Cardinals once. And then when you look at who they've lost to, the Bills, the Rams, the Cardinals once and the improving Giants. So, you know, they are a good team. Um, They've got some phenomenal players, but I think they're sort of, they're beating teams that you'd expect them to beat and then lose into the better teams. Um, so it's sort of, I'm sort of 50-50 mm-hmm. on them at this moment in time, sort of agree that, you know, well, they are going to make the playoffs, and um, but I don't think they'll, I don't think they'll win the Super Bowl. Cool. Let's talk, talk go from Super Bowl into a team that was in the Super Bowl last year, the 49ers. Um, they're currently bottom of the NFC North. Um, they've got a 5-8 and eight record, and they've got a 1-6 and six home record this year. There's talk. Um, I don't know whether this is just stipulated. It's, 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 uh, they can't even find my fucking teeth. That's the one thing. Um, a lot of talk going on, but the receivers um, and the running backs are unhappy with the quarterback situation, according by some reports. They've gone from the Super Bowl to bottom of their group. What is going on with the 49ers? And this is a free fall, so whoever wants to go. Well, it happens a lot because. Everyone will talk about each year the team that wins the Super Bowl. The players <clears throat> suddenly become Super Bowl winners, want more money, demand more money. You can't keep them on the cap. You release them, they go elsewhere. <clears throat> the only position in football that's harder than that is a team that loses the Super Bowl because their players have made it. They want more money. They want more cap. You don't have the record to go with it. 
don't think it necessarily happened at the Niners this year that much. I mean, it's a huge downer to come off. Um, the injuries this year have blighted them. Hey, you can lose George Kittle for the season like that is just half the weapon gone. Debo Samuel's been out nearly what 11, 12 weeks of the year. Most of it was out eight, nine weeks of the year. They, they're, they're running back. It's it's killed and the quarterback's been exposed because of it. Uh, I don't think Jimmy Garoppolo is a franchise quarterback anyway. I'm huge on Nick Mullins. I think Nick Mullins would be a starting quarterback at five, six teams in the league. I don't think he's a, a great Super Bowl winning, but he's better backup than some starters in the league currently. I just think that it just needs... For me, I'm to settle. They've still got the core pieces. They've added Brandon Ayuk and Debo Samuel. Could be a great pairing. Kittle coming out of tight end in there. Jordan Reed's done a bit when he's come into in. I think they need a quarterback. I think they do need a a pass throwing quarterback to just steady them and lead them. I don't think Jimmy Garoppolo or Nick Munnins for that matter can stand in that dressing room and command an audience with those players. I think it needs, we spoke about Russell Wilson, Deshaun Watson, these guys, one of those would go in there and demand the respect and the guys, the rest of the locker room would stop and listen to them. And they have the ability to back it up. And I think that is for me, all probably the Niners are missing is actually just that finishing piece. And I think if they stay healthy, they'll be back. It hasn't helped this year. The Rams have got more organized. Kyler Murray's added another wide receiver and he's in his second year, so he's got better. Russell Wilson, DK Metcalf's in second year and they've looked good. It's just a tough division right now, but put the Niners in the NFC East and we wouldn't be having this conversation. They'd be walking it if they played six games against those teams. So, no, fundamentally, I don't think they're very far off. I think they're better than maybe it says on paper right now. Or they have the potential to be at least. Uh, you know, you talk about the bottom of the division, but you look at the teams that are in there and, it, you know, potentially the hardest division in football right now. And what is one thing that the 49ers will be wanting next season, I think, above anything else, is healthy players. Um, you know, Garoppolo, like Dan says, is he a franchise quarterback? No. Um, but he's been out injured as well. They've had... Kittle, who, you know, arguably is the second best tight end in the league out for the season. They've had Nick Bursa, who's out for the season. Mm. And, you know, Kittle and Bursa are probably the 49ers' two best players. And they're out for the season. Sherman missed a lot on all, didn't he? Yeah, back. you've got Sherman, <laughs> who, who's out. Um, Debo Samuel, like Dan said, <laughs> who's been out. Um, Mostert's been out. It's you know, insane, then, right? <laughs> You've lost your number one quarterback, your number one running back, your number one tight end, your number one wide receiver. Um, pass rusher. Yeah. Pass, yeah, yeah. <laughs> number one pass rusher, number one <laughs> cornerback. And you've got to play the Seahawks, Cardinals and the Rams. Yeah. <laughs> they're not doing bad to win what they've won, right? <laughs> no, for sure. And they're still in with a chance of making the playoffs. And... How? How have they held on this long? And, you know, I don't think it's a case of they've gone from the Super Bowl to being terrible. There's a reason for that. And it's the injuries that they've suffered along the way. And I think if if they kept this team together and stayed healthy next season, I think, you know, it'll be a different story. Other than the fact that, obviously, you know, being in a difficult division is not going to not going to play in their favour. Because they're going to have, you know, six hard games along the way. but They're also not playing yeah. their home games at home now as well. <laughs> yeah. Just to add to it. Yeah. But they are going to be, you know, they're, they're going to be a different proposition next season if, if they can get everyone back fit and healthy and then stay healthy. Right. Yeah, again, the, the same echo, everything those guys said, really, is ripped apart by injuries. Um, I've only seen them once this year when they played us. They look quite good, but most teams do look good against us at the moment. Um, they've had a tough set of games as well. That's, you know, as Dan alluded to, they played Bills, Rams, Saints, Packers. 
back to back. Your Seahawks the week before that. You know, this is a team that's <laughs> had a very tough run and just being on the wrong end of that. You know, if, if they got a win early on in that run, then they'll probably win a couple more of those games and we're having a different conversation. Um, come next year, again, it is a tough division, but there'll be a better side, you know, provided obviously the players come back and they, they do okay with the draft. So I don't think it, I think it's just a bit unfortunate situation for them more than, more than a lack of ability or, or anything particularly wrong, really. I think if they had a decent quarterback, they could be scary. Uh, if they, let's say they went out and added to Sean Watson into that Niners team, oh, that's a proposition, right? Mm-hmm. Perfect. Right. Let's move on to the AFC and the NFC. Um, I know you guys want to talk a little bit about that as it's coming nearer to the end um, of the season. Um, at the moment in the AFC, uh, Kansas City are top, then it's Pittsburgh, Buffalo. Tennessee, Cleveland, in uh, the Colts, Miami, Baltimore, uh, the Raiders, New England, and Denver. And the other teams are out in the NFC. Uh, Packers, then New Orleans, Rams, uh, Washington, Seattle, Tampa, uh, Cardinals, um, Minnesota, Chicago, Lions, 49ers, <gasps> Giants, Philadelphia, and Dallas, um, and the Panthers, uh, and then Falcons, and then the Panthers. So, who do you think is going to get the wildcard places at the end? Free for all. Whoever wants to go first. I think in the NFC, I would... Obviously, the Falcons have now, unfortunately, been uh, eliminated from any contention. <laughs> which... Um, Take a deep though, yeah. The way we've performed this season... You know, I don't know how we've uh, not topped our division, to be fair. (laughs) 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 Um, But in the NFC, I think, you know, it for me probably stays as it is. You know, you've got the Packers, Saints, Rams and Washington topping the division. And then you've got the Seahawks, the Bucks and the Cardinals in the wild, wild card spots. So I think, you know, for me, it's probably, I won't be surprised if that's how it ended at the end of the season. Um, I suppose the one you could look at is the NFC East is still incredibly close um, because everyone's got a losing record in there and they're all so tightly knit together that that could literally flip on its head by the end of the season. But for the rest of it, I think it probably stays the same. Um, In the AFC, when the teams that are still you know in with a chance are the Pats and Broncos, I don't think either of those two get there. Sorry, Fred, but I I think we're out. We're gone, yeah. Um, Raiders or Ravens, they could both sneak in. Yeah, I think I said about was it two, maybe three weeks ago? I don't know if it's on air or off air that the Ravens would win out and make the playoffs. Mm-hmm. And I think they had the Steelers that week, and obviously they were blighted by injury and lost it. But they're still on path to win out. And I think in the AFC, with the fixtures Miami have got left and the fixtures the Ravens have left, the Ravens will pick the Dolphins to that seventh spot. <laughs> Bastard! Just because yeah. you got to play, mate. You've you've got some tough games to go. Oh, yeah. The the Ravens don't. I haven't got it in front of me. I know they have got the Jags this week, but their their big tough game that I think there was a, the, the debatable one was this week, which was the Browns, which they won in an amazing game. Um, defenses were left on the coaches, and they just went out to score points. It's crazy. Um, but yeah, I think they'll win out and steal that last spot. Yeah, my my head is telling me you ain't going to make the playoffs. My heart's telling me you're going to. But my head's going because my I think we, we've just got too much of a tough running. Um, you said you needed two games, right? But you're yeah. tired with the Ravens. Okay, you've got a kick up. But if they win three, you win two. They take it. Yeah, so uh... that's the only thing. The only thing is, in, in, I think what I listened to the Dolphin UK podcast um, and in history, the team that has won 10 and 5, I think it was, with what the record we've got, have majority of the time, I think it's like 96% of the time, um, have made the wild card or gone through. So that's my only thinking was going with that, was we need two, at least two, to give it a chance. And that's my only thing. But I do think we won't make that. I think the only thing that's going to let us down is our injuries. 
and our running game and our receivers. Tua won't let us down because he's a god among men and nothing can ever do anything get wrong against him. But I do think we are missing. But I think the best thing that we can say as uh, as as fans for Miami is there is a foundation there that Brian Flores has done that you can see where the future's going. You can see that what we need, but you know that he's going to get it. And you know that over the next few years, we're going to build, this team's going to be built. And hopefully when next year comes, we can spank Mahomes and make him our little bitch. But we have to wait and see what happens. Fred, I'm going to go with you. Yeah, um, just to pick you up on the Miami point. I mean, Miami is a team that's been a joke for a lot of the last few years anyway. And yeah, they've been really, really improved and really impressed me this year, to be honest. I don't think they'll make the playoffs. I think the Ravens will pick them to it. Ravens have got Jags, Giants and Bengals. Mm. Yeah, they've made it. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, your, your easiest game is against, against us isn't it, this week, realistically, yeah. and you don't have a particularly good record against us either. You know, um, and we beat you earlier on in the year when you were poor. So, you know, that, and that's that's a game you should win, but still, it's, it's not a game that you'd think, oh, you've definitely got it in the bag. Um, with regards to the NFC, um, I think everyone down to the Bucks is all but all but secure. Um, so, so that's top six of that. Um, Cardinals, Vikings, Cardinals. Um, what's the what's the Vikings running looking like? I haven't actually looked that up today, but yeah, I think you'd probably go with the Cardinals. They're also a bit more exciting to watch, I think, than the Vikings. So I'd rather see the Cardinals there. So I think um, so I think yeah, there's top seven in the um, in the NFC. I'm happy with the AFC. I think the Dolphins will drop out and the Ravens will slot in. Perfect. That lovely segue goes straight into our um, predictions um, this week. Let's get into it. So let's go over for the overall. I don't want to do this at all. No way shaping. Welcome to the top, Freddie boy. <laughs> yeah, it's lovely. <laughs> so let's go through this. So I'm going to quickly run through what happened last week. Um, so Kansas City versus Miami. Everyone apart from me went Kansas City. Um, Washington at uh, San Francisco. Uh, me and Fred went for Washington, um, so we get the points there. Green Bay Packers, we all went for them, um, and they won. Um, and then the last game is everyone, apart from me, because I'm a spiteful arsehole, um, went for the Vikings. Uh, everyone went for Tampa Bay, and they won, and I went for the Vikings. So the overall score, um, bottom is uh, me. Uh, second from <laughs> bottom is Rob on seven points. And the top two are Dan and Fred. And going into this, we've got we've picked some very difficult games. Um, that, well, I think are difficult games anyway. Uh, going into this, there's there's one that's we've had to put in that's quite easy for everyone, and then we've got the other ones that are quite difficult. Um, just seeing which one everyone thinks is the quite easy one. Seeing how everyone goes with that one. <laughs> Wait for Rob's face. <laughs> so right, let's get to the first game. Uh, Tampa Bay. Um, at the Falcons, Rob. <laughs> Don't do it, man. Don't do it. <laughs> uh, let me just. At least breathe. when you lose, you can cheer because you got something right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's actually my thought process behind it. <laughs> Basically, I have zero confidence in us, and you know, sort of. Pains me to say it, um, but I think it's going to make it a bit easier on me next week because Dan's not going to be able to come on here and <laughs> do it in my face too much because I'm going to be able to say, "Well, I agreed with you." So oh, we're coming, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think for this game, it's probably going to be one in the air, um, which is not. You know, anything offensively is not great for the Falcons, really. Um, we're going to have zero um, joy on the run against the Bucks, who are, I think, still ranked the top run defence in the league. If they're not first, they're second. Um, but actually, I think I'm actually all right with that stat because we can't run it anyway. So it doesn't matter whether we're running... You know, it's hard to try. If we were playing the worst run defense in the league, we still wouldn't be able to run it. <laughs> so the fact that we're playing the best just means we'll not be able to run it. Like there's it's no that bad at running. You score touchdowns when you didn't want to. 
<laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> Can't even get that right. <laughs> so I think I'm actually okay against coming up against the um, league's best run defense because we can't run it, you know. Anyway, um, we're actually, you know, 25th in running the ball, um, but we are second worst in yards per carry. Um, books are 26th in uh, total rushing yards. Um, they're slightly better on yards per carry. I think off the top of my head, I think they're probably, you know, getting about 4.5 yards or something like that and maybe seventh in the league. Um, and we're the 10th best defence against the run. So that's why I'm saying, you know, two teams which aren't great at running against two decent, well, one excellent and one decent run defence means it's probably going to be... Um, one in the air really which you know it's not what Dan's going to want to see he's going to want to see loads of running but I mean that's just my take on it um, our issue full stop is we just don't produce enough points um, so we'll just get a couple of field goals from Coop but I'm on ju- that I'm basis ju- I'm just going to say this as well you haven't actually said who you want to win you've sort of skated around <laughs> yes. you can't bring yourself to say it look <laughs> Oh, if I went on long enough that you... I know, I'm not. I'm, I'm waiting for you to say it. I'm forget not... our own predictions. I want to say the Falcons, but I'm going to have to say the Bucks. <gasps> we all know that. Uh, so I've gone for the Bucks. Um, I don't have to explain anyway. Uh, Dan? I, I have to go to I think you went Falcons. I fucking shit myself. I worry. <laughs> I've been a Tampa fan long enough to know that we screw these things up. I think we spoke about it a couple of weeks back when we had the Raiders, and it was a huge game because it's a game we'd normally go into and lose. Um, this feels like one of those. We've got two games against the Falcons in three weeks, so Rob has to go through all this again in two weeks and predict a loss again, probably for his side. So. <laughs> That's not going to go down well with him. <laughs> but yes, I would like to see us I'm retiring. You're done. <laughs> um, it is going to come down to a throwing game. Yes, we do have problems defending it. Yes, they've got Julio potentially back, even if he doesn't play Calvin Ridley. We are giving up points. I just think we'll have the ability to score enough points would be my read on it. So, Fred. Tampa for me. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to go quite as deep as that, but I think Tampa will win. I think they're clearly a much better side. Sorry, Rob. Um, the Falcons play calling gets moaned at week in, week out. I switched on the Falcons <laughs> for five minutes on Sunday and they try a sort of first and long and get picked. So, you know, I thought there's nothing really screaming Falcons for me. I'll go Tampa. Watch Dirk pull it out of the bag now. He's, <laughs> yeah. he's saying all these plays. He's like, if we just use these five, they won't know nothing that's coming out of them. He saved it. <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen. Right. <laughs> the next game, I was going to do this one last, but I thought as we're doing it on friendly rivalries, um, we've got Miami against the Dirty Pats. I mean, uh, in New England Patriots. Um, so... Obviously, I'm going Miami because we're just so much better in every single way. And they've got Cam Newton, so they're not going to do anything. Um, I I regret doing this shit sometimes when I talk because I know it's just going to bite me in the arse at some point. Dan, I'm going to go to you. Don't do that. (laughs) The sensible call is Miami to win this in all my years following NFL, I don't think I'd ever thought I'd say that Miami would beat New England. I know these things are cyclical. It's how it's designed. I think Bill Belichick against rookies is 20 and 5. He has a way of beating rookies. Mm -hmm. The Dolphins have no run game and that is where the Patriots are susceptible is to a running game and the Dolphins don't have one. Mm -hmm. The Dolphins defense is very good at interceptions but Cam doesn't throw the ball so great he ain't going to get intercepted I am going to have to say Patriots dickhead (laughs) it looks like it's got like three 
it's going to be free all over in this game, to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, Fred, I'm going to go to you. Yeah, I mean, having what sort of a spineless Patriots offense last Sunday and, and you know, having to watch just start really slowly against a team that likes to start fast. Miami do have the most points in quarter one, don't they? I think of any any side this season. Yep. Right? I think it's 97. Um you know, that said, I'm going to go Pats because I support the Patriots and I've got to back them and do you have a, you know, beat the Dolphins earlier on in the year and I don't really have much logic to back that up with. So um, we're going to go Pats. Rob. Um, I'm going to join you, Mark, and go for the Dolphins. Oh, well, yes. You know, there's a reason you two are bottom two. <laughs> 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 Clear. It might not be after this week, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, just no real, not too much thought gone into this one. I just, you know, think it's the, the right call. The, yeah. <laughs> I think the Patriots have just, you know, you look at games, they've scored three, they've scored 10, they've scored seven, and then they've scored 45. And I just, I don't know. Yeah, but I we only think... scored 45 because defensively we're well set up and the special teams did well. It's no, you know, it wasn't an offensive thing. Yeah. Was it? Tua has a mistake in him, right? So that's there. <laughs> so, no <laughs> Dolphins run game. Cam can't throw interceptions. Tua has a mistake. You have a decent up. <laughs> it's yeah, on. Just, the God doesn't know. make mistakes. Yeah. I don't know, he sort of does. Yeah. <laughs> Not even the Eagles yeah. person could overtake two in college, so no chance. <laughs> I think you had, Dolphins had four turnovers against Kansas and lost. I think if you give any other team that's a half decent team four turnovers against Kansas, they beat them. Nah, never. That, Mahomes is just ridiculous. I'm not taking that. And your and your logic is rubbish. So, next, our next one <laughs> <laughs> Seattle at Washington. I've gone for this. Um, I've gone Washington. I don't know why. I really don't know why I have, but I just want to. Um, Fred, I'll go to you. Yeah, I'm really torn on this one. Um, and reading the Seattle Seahawks record this year didn't help me either. Um, Smith is fit, isn't he? Um, <laughs> Sunday. <sighs> Split. I was hoping to go last and sort of pick some ideas of other people, but I'm <laughs> going to go for Seattle purely because they beat them earlier on in the season, although I do think they'll struggle against an improving Washington side as they struggled against an improving Giants side as they've struggled against pretty much most teams with a winning record, although Washington haven't quite got a winning record. They are falling to the improving category. I'm going to go Seattle and probably hate myself for it. Rob. Same as Fred, really. This is, you know, I'm really torn on this. I mean, when you look at Washington, started two and seven, they've won the last four games. Wilson is getting sacked a lot. Washington's defensive line is performing well. Smith is questionable. Um, I don't know. I am tempted to go with Washington, but you know, Seahawks are at home. They've just destroyed the Jets. Is that going to put them back in the groove? Um, I think it's a really tough one to call, mm. but I am going to go with the Seahawks. Uh, and then the last one, I'm going to the disappointment. I mean, Dan, um, who are you going for, Washington or Seahawks? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Why am I I'm upset with you. Yeah. I'm upset with you. I'm not going to lie. We'll see when next <laughs> week comes around, mate. And you, can man, apologize. Yeah. you can apologize oh, for if, that if, one. If, if Pats win, I'm going in hiding. I'm doing a Rob. I'm retiring. I'm not doing it. Like Says so you and Rob missing. Great, Fred. We're going to have fun yeah. this week. <laughs> I didn't find this one as hard as you guys. And I'm, I'm as you guys are speaking, I'm wondering if I perhaps should have done. But I think we even said earlier, Seattle has struggled against teams that will put up points against them because they can't score enough. They'll score loads, but not enough. But Washington don't strike me as a team that will put up loads of points against you. Gibson out, potentially. Smith out, even if he plays, he isn't going to be a world beater out there. I think the Washington defense will hold Seattle better than some have, but I can't see their offense outscoring Seattle's offense. And for me, therefore, Seattle win. 
Oh, bollocks. I regret my decision slightly now. Uh, <laughs> last game that we've got down here, which is Kansas City um, at New Orleans, at the Saints. Um, I've gone for Kansas City. Dan, I'm going to go to you. Tough one. Potentially Super Bowl this year, I think, for me, the way things are shaping out. I think a lot will depend whether Saints play a tight end at quarterback or whether they bring the old man back. Um, the Saints' biggest weapon is having Kamara without doubt, and he's been underused with Taysom Hill under centre. If they bring Breeze back and a Kamara picks that back up, I think they can cause the Saints problems because they're not wonderful against the run. And I think the Chiefs will probably just nick it because of their ability to hang in games no matter what and just find points from somewhere. It's going to be good, though. Should be a really good game now. Yeah. Uh, Fred, I'm going to go to you. Yeah, I, I do think the Chiefs, but I do think the Saints probably losing last week was the best thing that could have happened before this game because they'll have a point to prove. You know, they wouldn't have gone to Philly against the rookie QB and expected to lose the shape. Philly were in prior to that game, and I think there'll be a rocket up there, their backside. Um, I think it will be a really good game. As what impressed me about the Chiefs this week was obviously you know went quite a few points down quite early on, and quite often they'll win games and they'll, they'll look close in the end, as we've sort of talked about before. But they'll be well ahead in those games, then become close. Um, but then you know to sort of come from behind, do do really well, I think stands them in good stead and just proves that they're a very good all-round side and they sort of seem to have an answer to most questions, don't they? Um, so, yeah, I'm going to go go Kansas. Perfect. Uh, Rob? Um, Chiefs for me. Um, I know Miami gave them a scare in the first half last weekend, um, but like I said, you know, Mahomes is that sort of player that just says, Come on, guys, I'll carry us through this. And um, like I've said as well earlier today, I'm not as high on the Saints as, you know, some things I read online and, you know, what's said on here and what other people are saying on Twitter and what the NFL power rankings are saying. And, um, you know, that's not just the bias of the fact that I hate the Saints with a passion. Um, the good but, news is they're screwed for the next three years, mate. After this year, <laughs> they are finished. Yeah, <laughs> I know. But, you know, I've not seen an awful lot of them this season, you know, bits on Red Zone and stuff. And I thought, you know, they looked like they were going to be a good good team, um, which they are, you know, they, they are a good team. I'm not saying they're terrible. I'm not saying they're overperforming, but I don't, I'm just not as high on them as, you know, some other people are and the two games where I've properly watched them against the Falcons like I've said is I think the Falcons could have won both those games if it wasn't for you know stupid mistakes and questionable play calling we could have done better there and we weren't we didn't get blown out we lost by you know a couple of you know I think one was a one score game and one was a two score mm. game and you know we had the opportunities if we'd have executed better to win both those games. Um, all right, they had Hill behind centre, not Breeze. Um, but I just, you know, I'd just see my, uh, Kansas City win this one. It was just announced just two seconds ago while Rob was talking that Matt Breeder has been, uh, the running back for Miami, has been taken off the um, injury and COVID list for the game on Saturday. So we might actually run. I doubt it. I really doubt it. I just it. add to Saturday. that then. We, the Tampa have got no kickers this week, punters or kickers. They've signed free agents just to get them through in time. We've just lost Ronald Jones to the COVID list as well. Um, Can I change Ravens, my mind back to the Falcons, please? <laughs> <laughs> the Ravens have just had their whole wide receiver core put into isolation because of a contact. Jesus. Yeah. So uh, we'll see how it plays out. Yeah. <laughs> There's a bit of time so, between now and then, but... Oh. Let's run through all of the answers of what we've done so far. So <laughs> for the Tampa Falcons game, everyone has gone for Tampa. Even the Falcons' own fan, Rob, has gone for Tampa. Just rubbing that in a bit. Uh, Kansas City are at New Orleans. Everyone has gone for Kansas City. 
Uh, Seattle at Washington. I'm the only one who has gone for Washington. Everyone has gone for <laughs> Seattle. I slightly regret that decision now. Uh, and for the Pats at Miami, um, me and Rob have gone for the world's greatest team, Miami. Um, and <laughs> Fred and Rob have gone for the shit Pats. Um, so it's going to be... <laughs> How could I pick twice? Yeah. Well, I'm up. There you <laughs> go. You do it twice. <laughs> I, if any, I just want to say thank you ever so much for everyone coming on. Um, it's been a fantastic episode as well. Um, we have recorded the Christmas Day special, um, which will be coming out Christmas Day at three o'clock. Um, so if anyone's eating your turkey and done whatever you wanted to do and you just <laughs> want to watch some shit Reading FC quiz, um, you'll be able to watch it. But we are recording a New Year's Day special coming up Sunday, um, which is a uh, general uh, pub quiz where everyone can get involved as well. Um, but we will see you guys next week. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Fred. Um, and we will see you guys next week for which could be either this could be the very last episode of the podcast, or it could be a very entertaining podcast. It all depends on if, if Miami win or lose. If they lose, I'm not doing it. I refuse. <laughs> so we will see you guys next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.